I'm here with our local historian, Bruce Bell. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Sandy. How are you doing? Very Sandy? well, thank Great. you. Great. Well, Bruce, I see you're a historian, journalist, author, playwright, actor, stand-up comedian, curator, tour director, entrepreneur. How do you find time to do all these things? You know, I've always wanted to do what I'm doing for the last, I've been so lucky for the last 10 years to do this. And you really have to diversify yourself when it comes to doing, especially, I, I concentrate on doing walking tours. Uh, but sometimes the weather gets in the way, and so it's always good to uh, have something to fall back on. Historically, I love anything to do with Toronto history. So some days I'll do a walking tour, the next day I'll give a, a lecture on the history of Toronto, or I'll go back to, uh, you know, I write an article for the local bulletin, a monthly article on the history of Toronto. So I'm always doing something that's historically bent to keep myself uh, busy, truly. So it's, uh, it, it has worked out quite well. And what led you to become a historian? You know, all my life I just have loved history. Always. Like my dad loves history, my mom loves history. I think it was in the genes. I think genetically there are certain people on earth who are just prone to just, maybe it goes back to the cave days when the person who was really good at history knew where the food was because they could remember how to get there. So I always figured either, you know, some people love math and it's just ingrained in them. Well, history's been ingrained in me. I've loved it since far back as I can remember. And, but I never really got into it, you know, until the last 10 years ago. I was always doing something else. I spent 20 years as a, an actor, another 10 years as a stand-up comic and as a playwright. And it wasn't until, you know, I started to get into my 40s that I said, you know, I got, I've got to do something that I have a passion for. Mm -hmm. And truly, history, I said, I'm going to, I am going to do it. I'm going to now settle down and start doing tours. Well, I noticed that with your history, that you tend to focus a lot in this neighborhood, the St. Lawrence Market neighborhood yes. in particular. Why is that? You know, this is where it all started. You know, not only with the British for the last 200 years, but also with our First Nations. They were here for a thousand years. The French were here for a hundred years. So, I mean, right here, especially where we are right now in our building, the Performing Arts Lodge, which is right next door to St. Lawrence Market, this is the very beginnings of Toronto. Probably the beginnings of Canada. People have been coming here for a good, we think it's maybe 1,200 years people have been coming here. But it was really when the British arrived in 1793 on this very spot where we are sitting right now. And that always, truly, uh, had always, since the day I moved in here in 19, 1993, uh, I was very aware of it. I said, you know, I am here right where it all began. And that's when I started to look into the history of the neighborhood. And I realized the more I looked into all the, just what are some are just parking lots today? What used to stand there? And I would delve into the history of what was on that parking lot. And that's how it, how it started. And I uh, approached uh, the local paper, the Bulletin, saying, I have a few stories. Would you mind publishing them? That was 1999. And from that, I started writing for the paper. And people started, you know, asking to do tours. And I have been now writing, you know, for f almost 15 years on the original settlement, as it was known as the town of York here the St. Lawrence neighborhood, and I still have not run out of ideas for stories yet. So it's been 15 years. So much has happened in these few streets that we live in. Well, what would people, uh, what would you like people to know about this particular neighborhood? What uh, special stories hmm. would you like to bring to light? You know, I do uh, tours at St. Lawrence Market on a daily basis. Uh, you know, I, I base my business out of there. And what I really like to tell people is just how fascinating that market is. Most people come into St. Lawrence Market, they shop, they buy some food, some bread, some cheese, and they leave without really knowing about the history of the market. Uh, and I like to bring people into the market, which is also built on top of the old City Hall of Toronto. I mean, the very first City Hall was built there. And in the basement of St. Lawrence Market is the old jail of the city and there's one wall left from that old jail that still has a couple of chains in it and I'd like to bring people down to that jail and say this is where we came from. I'd like to show people 
here and tell people that Toronto wasn't always this great multicultural, most liberal city, equal rights in the, in the entire world, that we were once uh, a, quite a very divided you know, city you know, without prejudices, where people were thrown into prison for uh, speaking their mind. And I, I like to tell that to people. You know, you, 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 you just didn't end up like this. You didn't just start as the great city. We worked to get here. Uh, you mentioned there was a prison in this mm -hmm. exact location. Where exactly was it? And uh, how was it How was it run? Well, it was right, as soon as you walk in the main entrance of St. Lawrence Market, it was, it's right below you. It was right there. And it, like I said, it's, there are a few walls that are still left. And it was a, more of a, a jail, a holding cell for people who were on their way to the big prison, sometimes to be hanged. Uh, it was for people who were, back in the day, it was built in 1844, you couldn't walk down the street talking to yourself. You couldn't stand on a corner and scream, like sadly we see today. You couldn't, uh, you know, what we take for granted today, the, the freedoms that we had. Back in 1844 when that jail was built, you know, life was very strict and you, were, you had to, you know, status quo, you could not veer off at all. Anything that was considered different was, was a crime. And there were people being hanged, mostly for treasonous offenses, saying, you know, death to the queen was a hanging offense, singing uh, Yankee Doodle was a hanging offense. You know, anything that was seen as treasonous. And you could be thrown into prison for years without even being told why you were in prison. There were people in that prison, you know, underneath St. Lawrence Market who could have been chained to the wall for two years and their family didn't even know they were in there. I mean, this is all before our justice system was, you know, redefined in, you know, 1898 when we finally got a proper justice system. Uh, people were tortured, you know, hung upside down, you know, whipped. Again, for ridiculous, what we would consider ridiculous crimes. You mentioned that people could be hung for um, discrediting the song the Yankee Doodle mm -hmm. or the Monarchy. Well, if this is Canada, yes, how it, do we it, get into these two <laughs> different nations? Well, you know, Yankee Doodle was seen as a, uh, a very anti-British song. It was illegal to sing that song. It was an American song against the king at the time during the revolution. So it wasn't so much discrediting the song, it was just seen as a treasonous song. And we've come across many accounts of people, you know, getting drunk in a bar and standing up and singing that song and, and, and the army being called in to drag them out. Um, and we were a very British society. I mean, oh, you know, in the early days you were either British born or American born. Forty percent of the people living in early Toronto were American coming up here from, uh, you know, at the States after the Revolution to be, you know, United Empire Loyalists, to be loyal to the King. So there were very few what they call, you know, Canadian native-born people living here in those first couple of years. Most of the people here were American and, you know, the other 60% were British. So it was a very British society, completely so loyal to the King that they were willing to die, die for that. And that's where we came from. There was no immigration whatsoever. Uh, the Americans that were here wanted to be here. They wanted to be loyal to the king. We used to have a town crier uh, right across the street uh, in Market Lane Park today. That used to be the old town square of the city where people were publicly punished, where people were put into the stocks, people were whipped. And there'd be a town crier, a man who would be ringing the bell, ringing the news. And his, what he did was, uh, he didn't r truly ring the news of the day like you see, hear ye, hear ye. He rang every morning to say there is still a king, King George the, you know, the fourth is still uh, the king of England is still our king, and that's what you waited for. As long as that man rang the bell and told you there was a king, everything was fine. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the very birth of our city. Now you mentioned there was a percentage of Americans that came here after the revolution. Was that what forty percent? Forty percent were Americans. And what was the cultural makeup then? Um, it was, you know, most of the people came here from New England, of course. And also, we, you know, one, one thing that we have to be very proud of, we didn't have slavery here. We abolished slavery in 1793. Uh, and when Parliament stood down the street, a few blocks from here, Berkeley Street, Berkeley and uh, Esplanade, is in uh, August of 1793, they said there's going to be no slavery. 
They thought America was a very unchristian country for what they were doing with the slave trade. And England, too, was starting to dismantle its slave trade. But because it was such a massive business in England, it took them a while. But because we were very new here, we said, no, we can do it. We are not going to allow uh, a slave market. There's going to be no buying or selling of people in where we are, Upper Canada, in York. But some of those Americans that were coming up here were bringing their slaves with them. So they kind of altered that law uh, to say that, okay, you can bring some slaves in here, but you can't sell them. And there were a few families here living in York and streets where we walk today that were slave owners. Uh, the Jarvis family, who they named Jarvis Street after, they were, uh, they owned slaves. Um, also, uh, Peter Russell, who was um, the head of the executive council, almost like the lieutenant governor. They named Russell Hill Road after him and Peter Street. He was also a slave owner. And that was always a real, irked a lot of people living here, saying, why do these wealthy people get to have slaves when slavery is illegal. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, people, uh, you know, just thought it was just a terrible, it was, a, it was a, a crime against nature as they, they saw it. But it wasn't until 1833, we had about maybe 5,000 people living here at the time. In 1833, it was completely abolished in the British Empire, and, and especially here, and that was the beginnings of the Underground Railroad, more Americans coming up here, uh, maybe 30, 40,000 uh, freed slaves looking for freedom. And Toronto, Canada, and freedom were the same word. And that always just sent chills up me that, that they were coming right here, right where we are right now, was where the dock was, where those slaves got off. Well, they weren't slaves anymore. They were free. We don't even use the term Underground Railroad in Canada because there was no need to be underground. So those first people that came here were from Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and completely loyal to the king, so much so they had to give up all the land that they owned down there to come here. And subsequently, the government gave them 200 acres each that they came here. And a lot of those early people eventually become really rich because those 200 acres became the city of Toronto. And those first families, known as the Family Compact, became very wealthy by selling off this land. And uh, any um, remnants of those families in this neighborhood? No. Now, I have done a few walking tours and a few speeches in the neighborhood where people come up to me and go, oh, I'm a member of the Jarvis family, but, you know, many, many, many generations. I've met a few Jarvises and a few other people, too, the Rideout family. They were also one of the first families. Uh, but so many of them are... Uh, Living. I don't think any of them actually lived downtown, though. I think a lot of them had moved out into the suburbs, like the Cothra family. They became one of the wealthiest families in the early days, and they were given 2,000 acres and ended up becoming Mississauga. So yeah. you can imagine how wealthy they were. But they just lived around the corner at Frederick and Front, the Cothra family. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of those early families just lived in tiny little log cabins in the middle of the forest. I mean, we forget that this great neighborhood we live in, the beautiful buildings and condos and streets and sidewalks, was an old growth pine forest by the time the British got here with trees that were six, seven hundred years old, you know, 400 feet tall and very densely packed. It was just blackness when they got off, off the boats. It was just this dark, deep forest that was really scary also. I mean, filled with wild animals and they had to chop these trees down you know, and, and when they arrived in August of 1793, they had three months to build the town before winter came. And these trees were enormous. And that second generation of young men were known, they were known as bread to the axe. They were born to cut down these trees and they spent their entire life from morning, noon, and night felling these great trees. That was their whole life. And it was that second generation, these bread to the axe that did that. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit to when you said those families who came over from the U.S. brought with them slaves. Mm -hmm. And at some point later on, the whole, the whole system was abolished yes. where they were no longer allowed to keep slaves. Yes. Those slaves, did they remain in the neighborhood? Yes, they did. Well, there were many uh, what they called former slaves that lived in this neighborhood. Uh, this was over where the pizza, well it's not pizza pizza anymore, the works restaurant right. over in that area. 
That in the town of Church Jersey, in front. Church in front. Was, I, would, I wouldn't say it was known as the black area. There was very little discrimination in Toronto when it came to color. The real discrimination was religion. It was you were either Protestant or Irish Catholic, mm -hmm. and the, the vast majority of blacks were Protestant, and, the, and the, they had a little bit more a clout than an Irish Catholic. But they lived in this neighborhood. A lot of them had left to go work on farms because they were farmers when they working on the plantations and they went out to places like Bolton and, and around the city to become farmers. But there was a very, a uh, couple of them had, those gentlemen had worked, uh, worked, they fought the War of 1812 mm -hmm. on the British side and they, you know, they were given land uh, here in downtown. There were many stories of a lot of these uh, early black families living here in this neighborhood and living quite comfortably. And what contributions did they make to this neighborhood? You know, there's a few uh, plaques to uh, the, bl the black families that lived here. We just put one up across from St. James Park to um, uh, one of the first early newspaper women, uh, Mary Ann Shad, and she was a black newspaper, the very first woman to edit a newspaper, black woman to edit a newspaper. And she was an American who came up here via the Underground Railroad to give a speech, I think, uh, to give a speech to help raise money for abolitionists. And she fell in love with a local barber, a white guy, who had a barber shop here in the St. Lawrence neighborhood. And they uh, married, and she lived here for the longest time, and then they went back to Boston. Well, they just last year they just put a plaque up to her on King Street, right across from where the fountain is at St. James Park. And you'll see this Marianne Shad, this great plaque, and there's another plaque in uh, St. Lawrence Hall to uh, Frederick Douglass, maybe the greatest American who ever lived. Really? What he went through, I mean, as a young boy, he was a, born into slavery, I mean, and, you know, whipped on a daily basis by this insane master who later he found out was his father. And, and then he wrote his famous book, his autobiography, which really changed history because white people now were reading uh, these books written by slaves, that and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, written at the same around the same time that showed that people were saying, "Wow, you know, black people have feelings." You know, they never thought of that. It's um, you know almost like today, if, if a, a, a cow being had, led into slaughter wrote a book and say, "Why are you doing this to us? We feel it hurts," and that's how that was when these books were written. And that he just pushed, you know, uh, this whole movement, the abolitionist movement in America. Uh, you know, to end slavery, and he came here to our neighborhood many times. He would shop at St. Lawrence Market. Did he actually live in the neighborhood? No, well, he lived in Rochester, but he would stay in various hotels that were in the neighborhood. I mean, he was considered, I mean, he was the man who helped Lincoln write the Emancipation Proclamation. But he came here in uh, a couple of times in the 1850s and 1860s to give speeches at St. Lawrence Hall. He's actually the first person to speak at St. Lawrence Hall. He was given that honor. And he worked to raise awareness and money for the uh, his underground railroad. And what other businesses did they also have? Uh, barber shops were very, and beauty salons uh, were that hotels. One of the wealthiest men in the city was a free black American slave, uh, James Swan, and he owned a beautiful hotel called the Mansion House, which the Mansion, the House. Mansion House. Which is that the one in the East End? Or was well, it? no, this one was right downtown. Now there might be others since then. Uh, okay. His was, um, I think his hotel was where the Hot House Cafe, really? right around that neighborhood there. And he was a very wealthy man, very successful. He married a, a white Scottish woman and they had a daughter who was born kind of light skinned, but she of course was black. And he was always afraid that someone's going to marry her for her money. Right. And so he. Typical father. Oh, of course. You know, because he was a millionaire. Yeah. This black millionaire. We're talking about the 1850s, 1860s, when there was still slavery in America. Right. So it basically puts an ad in a newspaper saying, I'm taking auditions. I'm, you know, you come and meet me, and I'm going to pick up the uh, husband for my daughter. And he picks this guy finally, and he goes, Yes, you're the one. The daughter marries him. They go to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon. And the husband takes the daughter and sells her into slavery. I remember hearing that story. Well, they made a movie about it with, uh, um, um, oh, I can't remember his name. There's a, there's a thing, it'll come to me. Like James L. Jones or something like that? Well, something like that. Something Junior. Oh, God, it's terrible. I can't believe I'm remembering as many names as I can except that one. But there, it, Lou Gossett. Oh, Lou Gossett. Lou Gossett Jr. 
plays the, the Mr. Swan and his wife is Susan Clark, I think. What was the name of the movie? Uh, I've seen it. Great film because it takes place right here. Really? And he eventually has to go down into America disguised as his wife's slave goes to the plantation in Georgia, finds his daughter, brings her back to the Underground Railroad and brings her back to Toronto. And uh, is so apologetic to her, he builds her a huge home on the Don River, big mansion. She lived out her life in the absolute lap of luxury. Now the Beardsmore building. Yes. Uh, was that built by... Um, um, the one on the Front Street where the winner's story is? I heard that was built by one of the former slaves. Is that correct or am I wrong? Well, it's named after George Beardsmore, who was the Leather King. It was a Scottish guy, I think. Uh, not black, white guy. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I think we heard mention about a cab, uh, cab business. Oh, yes, the very first cab business in the city. Uh, Thornton Blackburn and his wife Lucy. They came here in the 1830s, you know, again, you know, escaping America. They came into Toronto. And uh, he had an idea for, a, I think it was a, for a cab, a handsome cab, which was becoming popular in, in London. He drew out the drawing for it, and he took it to a blacksmith shop, Bishop's Blacksmith Shop, which stood on the corner of Sherburne and uh, Richmond Street. The blacksmith shop? Yes. It used to be the Montreal Bistro back in the day. That corner. I don't know what it is today, that corner. It's been a while since I've been Condos. there. Condos. Condos, yes. So here Mr. Blackburn takes his drawing into uh, Mr. Bishop's, uh, John Bishop's uh, little shop and uh, gets the cab built. And he starts the first taxi cab service, becomes quite wealthy, buys a really big house on the corner of Eastern Avenue and Sackville, which is now the site of the Sackville School is there. And there's a big, two big monuments too, uh, Thornton Blackburn and his wife Lucy. There's a National Historic Monument and uh, the uh, Black Heritage Monument to how these, the, these two people were so instrumental in, in helping uh, the blacks as, who were escaping the United States uh, to come here. And they had this home that was, was a welcoming center for over 50 years. I mean, that really becomes um, the real center of black, early black culture in our and city. And of course, um, King Street is, um, marks the Underground Railroad passage. Where's this? At, at King, on King Street, King and Jarvis? King and Jarvis. What marks this passage? Um, the Underground Railroad, the Underground Railroad restaurant. Oh, was yes, of course, of course, of course. Oh, line. yeah, 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 oh, but that's a while back, yes, yeah, uh, Salome Bay. Right. Her, her and her husband opened the Underground Railroad restaurant on uh, King Street uh, near Sherburne. Was that a passage? No, no, I think they just called it that. Oh, I see. They just so. called it the Underground Railroad restaurant. It was a soul food restaurant at the time. And uh, Salome lived here, as you know, for right, a few right. years. I Great lady. I knew Salome. Oh, Interesting enough, oh. um, when Salome moved in the building, we had some kind of a connection. And I don't know why, but she felt connected to me. I found out that years ago, Salome Bay and my aunt were friends mm. in England, so they're both the singers. I had no idea. Wow. Amazing. Did she know that when she met you? No. Right, you met I, I was a relative that told me that uh, she knew someone with oh, me wow. back then, and my aunt and her were friends. They had the same agents, and they were singing clubs. Well, also, we had Jody Drake, who lived here for the right. longest time. She was one of the great jazz singers who I had met really early on in the early 70s when I worked at the Royal York Hotel as a busboy, and she was the singer in the lounge, and she, oh, she was something else, Jody Drake. Mm -hmm. So we're very lucky. I mean, we had a lot of great people come through here. I want to go back to the War of 1812 now. Mm -hmm. And recently they put up uh, a building. Um, it's called the Interpretive, the Interpretive Center. Yes, yes. And that's, that's because the old Parliament buildings yes. were on that site. Right. Let's talk about the yes. whole, mm. uh, the whole, the discussion of the War of 1812 and the importance of that time. And we are living right on this again, the same land that. Uh, you know, the War of 1812, there were battles and, you know, skirmishes right where we are. I mean, back in 1812, we still would have been right on the harbor, right on the water. Our building would have been just on the slope on the beach, because Front Street was the harbor front at the time in 1812. And, you know, America and Britain, Canada go to war. And 
the Parliament, we were the capital of Upper Canada. We were the, you know, the capital city of this colony. And the Parliament stood, you know, three blocks from here, over, just over on, on the corner. Um, Parliament Front. Parliament Front, that's the name, Parliament Street. And um, the Americans finally attacked York, us, in, uh, that's actually, this is the 200th anniversary this, this year. In, in, uh, they attacked us in 1813. It took them a year to get here. And they arrived in May for a week, and they they raided St. Lawrence Market across the street. They came in and they took all the food out of there. Back in 1812, it wasn't called St. Lawrence Market; it was just called the Public Market. Mm -hmm. So they raided the market. It was also the very first library of the city. It was just across the street in Market Lane Park. They stole all the books from there, and this was really outraging to people. They because a lot of the people living here were, like I said, born in America. They knew some of these soldiers too. Some of them were, they were related to these people. The War of 1812, I always thought, is like a civil war. I mean, it's, it was, you know, we were once one country at one time. So when the Americans did come and they were just so intent on taking over this land and turning it into part of the United States. And they were going to, that was the main drive behind that war is that we need to have this land as part of, you know, as part of America. But Britain had made a, uh, a deal with the native population to say, help us. You know, you help us win the war and we will uh, give you Michigan. Up, upper Michigan is your home country. And so you know, thousands and thousands of those, or the Mohawks and the Hurons were helping the British and they were brilliant soldiers. I mean, and they knew the forest. I mean, they were the ones that helped Britain win the war. Had we not had the First Nations on Britain's side, America easily would have would have won the war. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. They were so superior and advanced, but we really had, um, you know, we had the help. And also, just down the street from here, during the war, over by uh, Young Street, they were, the British were building the largest warship in the world called the Sir Isaac Brock. It was a 200-gun warship, and it was the largest warship ever built by mankind. And whoever got control of that ship would control the Great Lakes and would win the war. So when the Americans finally landed, Britain had to burn that ship. And it was one of the largest fires we had to that time. It was, it was just, again, a couple of blocks from here. This massive ship was being, you know, burnt to the ground. It was Young and Harbor. Right. Well, Young, Young and Front Street. Again, that was the harbor. Well, that's right, because... Right where Union Station up. is. That's right. Where Union Station is, Front Street being the, the harbor of the city at the time. And uh, they also had to destroy Fort York. And you know, Britain blew up the gun magazine at Fort York just as the Americans had landed at Fort York. And that explosion of all that ammunition was the largest explosion in North America to that date. And about 200 people died during that explosion, American and, and British. So the Americans finally made their way here and they raided the market. They were, you know, we're gonna raid everything else they could, work their way down to the parliament. And one night they set fire to the parliament. And, Britain always said to them, do not set fire to our parliament buildings. I mean, be gentlemanly about this war. You know, we, you can come here, but don't burn the parliament. So it was never really proven if the, if the Americans did burn it. It could have been, you know, the British burning it and blaming the Americans. But the result was that when America attacked Washington, D.C., you know, they set fire to the president's mansion. And it was after that fire they painted the mansion white it was known as the White House ever since. You yeah. say the Americans attacked Washington? No, the British. The British. Right, when the British, the British eventually worked their way down to so Washington. the British actually burnt the, the first White House. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, they did. I mean, and it really, it, they completely destroyed the inside, but the, the shell remained. And they rebuilt it, and they just painted all that burnt. Uh, now, when you say the British, were they also accompanied with uh, the Aboriginal people and Canadian Definitely, for so sure. It was, a, yes. it was a, yes. a joint effort. Oh, yes, it was, it was a joint effort. effort. Yes, to get yeah. rid of that White House. And that was a famous story of Dolly Madison, who was the first lady at the time, the Michelle Obama of her day. She was having a big dinner party that night, and she had planned it for the longest time. And she's, all her friends are coming over, and they look down the lawn, and they see the British coming out of all nights you know, with their torches in their hands. She says, okay, everyone, gather up all the food. Come on, we're going to go up to the hotel up, uh, up the street and we'll have our dinner party. And they ate dinner and they watched the White House, you know, get burnt. Mm -hmm. Now, I seem to remember hearing some story about uh, 
children in, in, in this particular neighborhood who had a lot of them had died from diphtheria. Oh, yes. Uh, was this, are we on part of that land right now? Oh, for sure. I mean, this was, uh, Toronto grew so fast in such a short period of time and in such a very condensed area. That cholera, one of the really terrible diseases, and diphtheria, and yellow fever, and scarlet fever, and whooping cough was another childhood disease. I mean, a woman, your job was to have as many children as possible because only half would survive childbirth. I mean, the, the disease was rampant in this, in this town. And open sewers, I mean, right where our building stands was the very first, uh, the sewer system of the city back in the early days would empty right here where we are. And now that um, is just, uh, Esplanade yes. and market, Law Market, uh, right. market Lane, right? Yes. yes. Okay. That's where the, 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 the big sewer pipe was and it just poured raw sewage right into the lake and it was filthy. But back in the 1830s, they didn't know that germs and... Hygiene wasn't was, their priority. Just, no, and it, they just never correlated the two. It's like today. We, some people say, you know, the cell phone's going to give you brain cancer, but no one's stopping using cell phones. And maybe a hundred years from now, they'll say, do you realize over a billion people died in 2020 because of cell phones and they had to ban them? Mm -hmm. That's what it was like with cholera. There might have been a few people saying, you know, having an open cesspool next to your home isn't such a good idea. You're breathing all that in, but it didn't stop anybody. And hundreds of people would die of cholera, especially cholera, because cholera was very fast. Uh, you once it, in, you know, it's, you're, you're drinking all that sewage, basically, and it, uh, you're happy and healthy at seven o'clock in the morning, and you're dead at seven o'clock at night. I mean, it, it just happened so quickly. And the common cold, the flu would kill you. There was no antibiotics at back in those days. Life was very swift. And even as the town grew into a great city, you know, with a million people, you, you know, especially the children dying, uh, there are many photographs of dead children dressed up, because it's the only, in a coffin, because it's sometimes the only photograph a woman or a parent would have of their child. The only memory. That would be this, that. And it was just a, a common occurrence. Very sad, of course, but to be expected. Today we don't expect it so much. It does happen still. Mm -hmm. We don't, but then you expected it. Is this child they just give birth to, is, will this die before they're two years old? And usually if they got past the age of two, you were kind of a bit safe. But the, the children's death was a, such a sad, sad part Did of our Do you know history. how many children died? Well, I know that. Oh, you know, I just came across that, that, uh, that information. Um, I think it was a third of the, of the, of the deaths before 1900 were infectious diseases, whereas today it's, it's rare. But I think the third of the deaths were, were a, lot. a lot. I mean, that's a, you know, a lot of people died of infectious disease. Even cutting your finger, you know, you could, you, you could die from infection. Where today we don't even think about that. You know, and what does scare us sometimes today when they say, oh, a new strain of flu has been found that has, you know, no antibiotics can kill it. And so, oh, is, this the, is this the one? Is this the next thing? But back then, it's just, you know, the average age, too, for, they didn't live long. I mean, in the 1830s, you were lucky to get to the age of 30. I mean, that's and just... there's also, too, being uh, the local uh, food outlet on the market back mm -hmm. then, and then you have uh, the sewage. Yes. The oh, of course. So oh, and you can, oh, and you can imagine, uh, and horse manure on the street. That's why this area was known as Muddy York, over at the corner of, you know, front Wellington and Church, where the Flatiron Building is. All the water after a rainstorm would come down from the hills and just wash into the streets that were here. And they weren't paved. And it was mud, and it was mixed with horse manure and horse urine. And you can imagine thousands of horses on the street mixed in with that mud, and then the flies coming, and the mosquitoes, and a really hot summer day after a rainstorm, how 
filthy and stinking this area was. And no wonder there was disease. And you know, you're trying to get around the city at the same time. And they also lived in the and they, city. And they lived, we lived here. There were all, a, a lot of the poor people too, as the city grew into a, an industrial area, where we are right now, where all the wharves and docks were. People were living under these docks. I mean, remember, there was no public safety nets. There was no um, welfare, no unemployment insurance, no public housing. I mean, you were on your own. Uh, no health inspectors. None of that stuff. You know, that came much later. And even though we might have a quarter of a million people here, you know, you, you lived, you know, as you went. I mean, some people lived quite well, and there were, you know, the middle class, the, you know, but a vast, huge majority of people uh, just lived yeah, on their own and living in some of these warehouses that are still standing today. Some of those top floors would have held 30, 40 people in one room. And if you were lucky enough to get a bed in one of those rooms, there could be 30 beds. You rented a bed sometimes for seven hours a day, just long enough to sleep, and then you were out. And that's where the term flop house came from, because you just flopped yourself down for a couple of hours. You paid a penny or two, and then you were out. But if you had children, and children were much like what we see, unfortunately, homeless men today on the street. You don't call the cops and you see a homeless man sleeping in the park. Of course, that's what children were like too. Today, if you saw a child sleeping on the street, you know, it would cause outrage. Oh my goodness. But 100, 150 years ago, you just expected to see children begging on the street, and especially in this neighborhood because this was the market. And you saw groups of, of young boys, you know, with their hands held out or like an old Very much so. And you know, he came here, Mr. Uh, Charles Dickens. I mean, he came to Toronto, and, to this neighborhood. He shopped at St. Lawrence Market. He stayed just down the street where um, it's there now. The Franz Restaurant is that Scott in front. Right. There used to be a hotel there, the American Hotel. Maybe he stayed that's where there. You got the I've often thought that. Listen, I often thought that because as soon as he left here, he wrote a Christmas carol. And I often thought, did he see Wonder. something here? Yes. You know, he came here, and so there were these kids. But again, you, you just, it's like, to, unfortunately, how today we, we see homeless men, and just, you know, oh, well, someone will look after you. Right. You know? And of course, there's also Hogtown. Yes, I mean, uh, one of the names I hate of Toronto, I hate that name. But, you know, uh, across the street at St. Lawrence Market, I think it was about 1848, a man from uh, Ottawa, writing a, for a newspaper in Ottawa, had come to Toronto and he was, you know, writing about the market and they used to sell live hogs in the market. And one of the hogs got out of the pen and pushed the writer into mud and the guy was falling back into the mud and he goes, damn, hog down! And he wrote that and it kind of stuck oh, ever I since. See. But we had over a million hogs were slaughtered over at the bottom of the uh, Don River in the, in the William Davies uh, processing plant and uh, the Gooderham and Wards had their own hog processing so we were known as that too for pork. I mean that was a real big thing and even today we go to St. Lawrence Market getting the back bacon sandwich is a thing isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we were known for pork and again that kind of stuck with the hog town. But one of the other nicknames that never stuck was Paris on the Lake. By 1900, we had almost a half a million people living here in the city, and the architecture started to take on a very Parisian look. Now, is that when they start to build uh, on the lake, which is now the Esplanade? Yes, the Esplanade, as we came into being in the 1850s, when the railroad came to the city, and they needed somewhere to put the trains. The trains didn't want to be 20 miles out of the city. No factory wanted to be 20 miles out of the city. They wanted to be right on the water. And just before the railway came, they were building a proper esplanade uh, to walk along, to be a lovely little walkway. As far back as 1818, right where we are, they built a boardwalk, they built the docks, ferry docks to go to the island. Back in the early days, even though the island was a peninsula originally, the island, as we know, was created in 1858. A big storm had gone through and opened up the, the gap there, the eastern gap. But you could take a horse and carriage up to the island. But some people wanted to take a ferry. It was a lovely idea, a lovely day out. And this is where the very first ferry dock stood, right here on the site of the Performing Arts Lodge. It was right here 
And this was the harbor front right until about 1927. And then in 1927, they pushed it out to, to whereabouts it is today. And it was all garbage, too. The whole harbor front in Toronto was just filled, landfill of household and, and commercial garbage. And every time they build on the landfill, they dig up that garbage. And you can see it just being lifted up. Now, when we talk about the St. Lawrence market, um, you said at one point that underneath they were like a, like a prison cell. Yes. And uh, you actually be, you were able to walk by and see the prison. Oh yeah, the people come on my tours. Because it's uh, behind the scenes, it's uh, not part of the, the, the daily market life. It's, you have to come with me and I have to show you where it is. But the whole old foundation of the market of the, that city hall is still there today. And where Domino's Foods is, which is the bulk food mm -hmm. underneath, in the, in the basement, that whole section was the corn exchange of the city. You know, corn still is a commodity. And back then, corn you know, came into the city, and it was, a lot of it was stored right there where... And we still have the annual corn. Yes, oh, for sure, we still celebrate corn. Mm -hmm. I mean, it even predates us, I mean, the, you know, us Europeans and, and you know the British that came here, I mean it's so very native too. You know, their love of corn and how it's make anything out of it. And another part of history of course is the distillery district, which is really part of this entire neighborhood. Sure. It's just it, a little further Yes. Yeah. Well George Gooderham was building is still standing, the Flatback building. You know, that was uh, he he built his distillery, which was then the outskirts of town. I mean that is even on the other side of Parliament Street, and that, in 1832, when they started to build that, was uh, in the middle of a swamp. I mean, that was a, a real cholera epidemic started in that swamp that was there. No one lived out that far. And um, Mr. Wartz, his brother-in-law, was building a windmill, and the people in the town could see this big windmill being built. And, and I mean, that was, you know, the first real industry in our city was uh, the Gooderham and Wartz. Which was gin, right? Uh, whiskey and beer, and uh, they made a fortune. And apps because they had a great recipe. Mr. Gooderham was a brilliant businessman, you know. Um, he, and it, almost, I'd like to say, one of the reasons that Toronto became the great city it did today, because other people saw Mr. Gooderham making a million dollars, and they said, "Well, maybe I'll come to Toronto also and make a million dollars." Did they have any connection to Seagrams? No, Hiram Walker. Okay. Hiram Walker, the other great company, they bought the Gooderham factory in, I think, 1923. So it was run by Hiram Walker all those years, so right up until, uh, I mean, it's still going today, Hiram Walker. But they moved out of there 2000, not, no, 1919 they moved out, I think, the distillery. Mm -hmm. So it operated just down the street all that time. Well, we really have a quite an eclectic neighborhood. Oh. And, it, and not just, not too far over from the distillery is Cork Town. The old Irish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. When the Irish arrived, the potato famine, the famine Irish as they came to be known, a potato crop in Ireland had failed in the 1840s and a million and a half Irish starved to death and another million and a half come to the New World and they settled in Boston and New York and Montreal and here. And they, no one wanted them here in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, then Toronto. They said, you get to the east end of the city and you stay there. And they didn't want any Catholic Irish coming into the city. So the, these little enclaves of Catholic Irish were formed and given the nickname. It was called Corktown because they left from County Cork in Ireland. And it was also Slab Town, Paddy Town, and Cabbage Town. And today, Cabbage Town and Cork Town, one time the worst neighborhoods in the city are now the most expensive neighborhoods. Yeah. 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 And when we, I'm thinking back to about the War of 1812 and the contributions that uh, a lot of the ancestry made mm -hmm. in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The Irish was part of that? They no, they came much later. I mean, they came, the first real Irish immigration started about 1848. And yes, they eventually did give a sh massive contributions to the city. And it was the Americans, when those very first Americans that came in, I mean, they brought with them uh, the apple pie was an American invention. You know, if you said, give me a piece of pie, before the Americans, it would have been fish or 
fowl pie, a chicken pie, but apple pie, what an interesting idea. The Americans also brought with them the split rail fence. Before they came, we were making you know stone walls that took forever to build, and they said, no, you make a split rail fence, and so much, it's so much easier. And the Americans also brought with them our very first city hall government. Uh, Britain made it illegal for more than three men to stand on the street corner and talk. Uh, but those Americans that were coming here, they said, no, no, it's a good way for us to do business. We're going to keep that. And that eventually grew into our first city government. And of course here, this neighborhood is known as the, the original was known as the meeting place. Yes, it was. This was in the, I, I think, the Huron language, Toronto, the meeting place. I mean, where and people that's what were, Toronto is. Yes. And, that's, and there's also another meaning for Toronto, I think in the Mohawk language, Toronto with a K in the end meant sticks in the water because a lot of those early Mohawks would spear the fish. Mm. And so the name, we're not really too sure what it truly means, but Britain had changed the name in 1793 to the town of York, and then in 1834, just across the street, when City Hall was there, uh, they changed the name back to Toronto. And so exactly what's the, what's the location of the City Hall in this neighborhood? Well, the very first City Hall, stood where St. Lawrence Hall stands today. The Great Hall? Yes. Now that, that first city hall was torn down and then St. Lawrence Hall was built. St. Lawrence Hall was built as a community center. It was never a city hall. But it happened to stand on the site of the very first city hall in the city. Then the second city hall was built where St. Lawrence Market is today. And that was always known as the second city hall. Mm -hmm. That's another really magnificent building today. St. Lawrence Hall. So oh, we're so lucky we still have the Great it's Hall. Still there. We're so lucky that. And then we almost lost that in the 1960s. They were going to tear it down. But luckily they saved it, and we were so lucky. Do you know what the plans are for that hall? There was always talk of turning it into a museum. And that's one thing we need. We need a museum to well, the city. Especially this neighborhood. Sure, I mean, you could, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's also talk of turning old city hall into a museum to Toronto. But uh, we're lucky we have the Market Gallery here, mm -hmm. you know, in St. Lawrence Market, which is really a, a museum to, to us, to, the, to this neighborhood. We should talk a little about that, because I don't know how many people really know that we mm. have this. This uh, museum to us, idea. for the last yeah. 35 years, exactly. there's been a museum to the city of Toronto that really does, I'd say more than half the exhibits are about uh, the St. Lawrence neighborhood. And it's open every day from, you know, 10 till 4. And when you come into the lobby of St. Lawrence Market, just take the elevator and press Market Gallery. And it's the old city council chamber of the city of Toronto. And what type of exhibits do they have there? And how so, often? I'd say four times a year they change the exhibit. And they've had uh, exhibits on the history of theater, the history of markets. The most recent one is the history of water purification and how that changed history when they started to clean the water in this city that we can now have drinkable water that's not going to kill you. And uh, they've had exhibits on the history of uh, St. Uh, Lawrence Market neighborhood itself, the history of Toronto Island. It's, it's a fat history of architecture. It's, it's wonderful uh, that mo more people should visit. Well, do you think maybe they do not give enough promotion uh, to attract people to it? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's one of the most no. secret secrets. No, it is. It, it truly is. And it, it, we really need to promote it more. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I, bring, I always start my tours there. You know, I always bring, start my tours there because it is. Again, it was built in 1844. It was the old city council chamber. The old mayor's chair is still in there. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating part of our history. And I'm so glad it's still in use today. Let's go on to a bit more about you and your tours and the talks. Tell me how you conduct your tours and how does one, um, how is one able to, to connect with you to be part of that tour? Well, thanks to the internet. I don't know how people did business before the internet. Uh, I have a, a website I've put together that talks about how you can take a tour with me. And uh, usually if you're new to the city, uh, a good first tour is St. Lawrence Market Old Town Tour. I mean, it, it, it's a two-hour tour, it's, and it uh, starts at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it really is the very beginnings of our city, and I'd like, and I'd love, you know, especially people who live in the neighborhood when they take the tour, you know, the things that I can show them and tell them. 
So that's my most popular tour, is the St. Lawrence Market Old Town Toronto Tour. It includes a tour of St. Lawrence Market, St. Lawrence Hall, St. James Cathedral, if available. Toronto's first post office, I mean the very first post office, is still standing in our city and still is a post office on Adelaide Street. And also I do tours of Cork Town and the distillery district. And I do tours also, I spread a bit uh, further out uh, to where the Royal York Hotel is in the Union Station. I do a tour of that area and along Bay Street, Osgood Hall, Old City Hall, New City Hall. So really a, it's a, a, about three or four tours, University of Toronto. You have to make reservations, you can't just show up. And how do you make reservations? Uh, phone me, my phone number is on my website and my website brucebelltours.ca uh, if you don't, if you're not on the web, and also through my, my newspaper, the Bulletin newspaper, I always advertise what I'm doing at the end of each of my articles. So there is a, you can always find me somewhere. And how reasonable is the fee? You know, if it's just, it, it the market is twenty-five dollars a person, but if you have a larger group, you know, the cost does come down. I do a lot of uh, school tours, also lots of schools now are coming to take the tour. I might do fifty, sixty students at a time. But most of my tours, you know, are you know, usually two to ten people, a small, small group. Two hours. Two hours. Do you have a food component to it? I can, yes. At, at St. Lawrence Market, there is a food tasting is available uh, that we can try. That really is no extra cost. It's just I, like, I usually ask people before, do you want to spend your time, you know, eating or exploring? And most people want to explore, and they can come back to the market and they can eat. And I usually like to show people, you know, the very Toronto local food, like the, the pea meal back bacon sandwich. I mean, that is a very Toronto thing. I like to show people that. And there's so much in that market. And on a really cold, rainy, snowy day, I can spend the whole uh, an hour in that market. You know, I, can, I hate to cancel a tour. I said, don't worry about the weather. You know, the market isn't closed. We can stay inside if you wish. Mm -hmm. And. Um you also do once a year um, like a boat tour, don't you? Well, I have in the past. Yes, I've done a, a harbor cruise, and I still do them. If someone wants a larger group, if they want to charter a boat, I can be their, their host on that, and we go through the harbor and into Toronto Island, and I just tell the story of, of you know, the history of the harbor and the, and the islands of the city, and you get some beautiful views. You know, from there, and I also I do you know bus tours if people want to have a coach, if a microphone in there. I always sit at the front, and we drive around the city, and I we go through neighborhoods up to Casaloma, you know, the Don Valley up to the brickworks there, and and I just do this ongoing history of the city. So I also do that. I haven't, and I go to New York too, and I've gone to Chicago. I've I've expanded you know all out and finding very similarities between, you know, our neighborhood and, and New York City. And do you have an exchange of tours? People who go to, uh, to who attend this tour here will go with you to the tour? Oh, yes. Oh, for sure. I've gone to New York and sh ten times now, I think, and same with Chicago, where people uh, who want to learn more about, you know, how similar Chicago and Toronto are architecturally and historically, too, and New York. How very similar, and how our cities all started around the same time and grew because of the railroad. We kind of look the same. You'll see buildings in, in all those cities that say, hey, doesn't that look like that building here in Toronto? And especially with Chicago. Chicago is a beautiful, beautiful city. Mm -hmm. and so this is a cultural exchange. Absolutely. And Jane Jacobs, who right. was a, you know, New Yorker who moved to Toronto in the 1960s, and they have the annual Jane's Walk every year in New York. And in yeah. Toronto, you know, so there's that culture. And it's in this neighborhood too. Yes, I, it's now it's all over Toronto. But the very first ones were done here. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, one of the instigators of the uh, modern Esplanade. It was, right. you know, she encouraged City Council at the time that you know cities should be for people and not for cars. Community. Yes, community. community, and it shouldn't be vast, empty high rises. It should be what the Esplanade, where we are today, is. Tell me something about uh, a highlight uh, or something that really gave you such rewards, such a great reward during these tours. Mm, you know, it's really meeting people from around the world. And I just, in the last couple of weeks, I've had 
I had some people from Moscow on the tour. Wow. I've had people, I had a woman last summer from Khartoum in the Sudan was on the tour. And it just, that is so fascinating because I get to show them our city and that's, it's, it, it blows me away too. Especially when I do have people, I've had people come from Saudi Arabia on my tour who have never left Saudi Arabia and have come here, you know, usually on, on you know, uh, for on a business trip and have decided to take a tour and I get to show them, you know, this great city and this great society that we do live in. Um, and that always moves me, that when I have people that come from, from all over the world. And what is their reaction when they hear these stories? Oh, about this you know, they had, a lot of them have no idea of, of Canadian history, let alone Toronto history. A lot of them come to our city having absolutely no preconceived idea of what to expect when they come here at all, or even what the city looks like. And the first thing that people always say is, I had no idea how big this city was. And coming from the airport to downtown, just how clean this city is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, oh, and then once they come here and take the tour, after the tour they say, I had no idea of this this vast great history that, that is here. They just uh, they had no idea. That's so they great. leave with a sense of um, awe and wonderment. Yes. Very exactly. much so. Mm -hmm. They so do. They take back to their country. Yes. To and say, they probably yes. share it with others. So this story travels. They, they, they do, and, they, and for them to say, you have no idea uh, of just how beautiful Toronto is, and, and, clean, and it's being clean, that's what everybody says about this city. Uh, you know, you go to any of these great cities, Paris, one of my favorite cities in the world, and Rome, coming in from those airports, you go through some pretty rough neighborhoods, mm -hmm. as you do in American cities too. Uh, we don't have that, you know, we really have this really beautiful city and that's the first thing that people notice, they say, I can't believe how clean this city is. And, and how safe, too, I mean, we are a reasonably safe city and people feel very comfortable here, even though it's one of the great metropolises on earth. So what is your next tour? I just did one before I came to here, I did two women, who me. They were from uh, Scotland, two women from Scotland. A lot of people travel in the winter, it's cheaper and it's less busy, and some people the cold doesn't bother them at all. Uh, this week I did it at Moscow and, uh, and Scotland. So uh, I'll be, I also do talks also, you can, on my website I always put my, my talks at Say What, the mm -hmm. nightclub down the street, where I talk about the history of our city, and I, uh, you know, I think the next talk I'm giving uh, in a couple of weeks in February is on uh, the people, people who change Toronto. Uh, not just Torontonians, but people who came into the, like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. How the Beatles changed the city mm -hmm. and how we perceive things. So uh, that's what I'll be talking about. Right. Now, I just want to move on a little bit. Uh, you were a playwright. Yes, I was. I loved it. I love writing and I loved writing plays. Uh, I wrote plays as a means for me, was that when I was an actor, to write my own parts. Right. That's quite sensible. It, it was. That's if you, sense. But it's hard to get things. You have to hire yourself. Well, you do, and that's what I did. And that's how it led to this to be in control of my own destiny. Right. And that's how that led to it. Rather than going every day and auditioning and auditioning and proving to people, you know, who I am, now I just I don't have to worry about that. And you wrote a play. It was Hibaku Shah. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the, 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 yes. Uh, Yes, uh, Shirley Douglas. Uh, Shirley Douglas was in that. It, uh, I asked her. Uh, it was done as part of a. I got a grant from. Toronto Arts Council. Yes, Toronto Arts Council to write this play. It was just a, a one night play, but uh, about the effect of AIDS on, on our city. And um, she, uh, yes, she was in it. It was wonderful. We had a party back here in my apartment, and Shirley Douglas came. And she knew a lot of the people living in our building. Of course, but that was good. That uh, that was one of the last plays I wrote. And after that, I wrote uh, urban loft dwellers about people who have all the lofts that have been turned into living lofts from mm -hmm. old days. But uh, as much as I enjoy writing for the theater, it, it's it, it's a lot of work. I mean, to get actors, to get theaters behind you, and it doesn't always work out. And uh, that's that led to this. Truly, from being a playwright to just now being a writer, and just again, it came down to just being in control of what I do. 
I, that kind of segued into your historical your historical. Oh, for sure, absolutely. You had so much absolutely. knowledge. And I was always a performer too. And my, my tours aren't I never look at them as walking tours. They're they're plays, they're two hour plays. Exactly. And my you know, my apartment is my dressing room and the city streets is the stage. And you come with me and you're part of this. We should document you on oh, these sure. tours. Oh, sure. And then, you know, do like a reality tour. Then, listen, yeah. absolutely. That would be really good. Sure. We should definitely look at that and think about that. Please do. Well, Bruce, it's oh, been Sandy. a pleasure. My goodness, an hour went by so fast. Um, it did. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.